Welcome to A Bun Dance. You guessed it, a podcast dedicated to all things surrounding dance. I am Kristen. And I am Hannah, and we are two best friends who are brought together by this art form. Please join us in five, six, seven, eight. Hey, Hannah. Hey, Kristen. How's it going? It's going pretty well. You know, it's good. We're in a new year. Yeah, happy new year, everyone. Hoping everyone has a healthy, happy, and uh, more hopeful 2021. Wishing you all very best. We're going to start things out today with um, just a little recap and uh, looking forward. So Hannah, what was your favorite dance memory in 2020? Probably my favorite dance memory was when I auditioned for the Lori Bellov and Ezra Duncan Dance Company because it was sort of a last minute thing. Well, not last minute as in like I wasn't rushing to do it before the pandemic hit because that's not something I knew at the time. But I'm just immensely grateful that I was able to audition in person before this all happened. And ever since I've had this really nice connection with them. And as I've talked about, I have an apprenticeship. So I'm just very fortunate and grateful for that audition in New York City back early last March. So yeah. That's yeah, that's favorite. awesome. And I think it's so interesting too, because like, obviously auditions, um, kind of got put to a halt early as we like talked about in our first episode and so things were so up in the air for a while but then just right before the new year hit it all kind of just came together for you and worked out super well so definitely yeah so I'm very very grateful and fortunate as I said um thank you Frack and how about you what's your favorite dance memory of 2020? It's honestly it's hard to choose I felt a little torn about this but I, I kind of have two. <laughs> One I would say is um, I was very lucky to see a couple live performances before down. I saw um, the Nutcracker actually when I was in my in Budapest, Hungary with my family in January. And that was actually just coming up on my Snapchat memories today. I saw um, oh, yeah. the Hungarian National Ballet perform the Nutcracker. That's incredible. And- Yeah, it was amazing. We actually couldn't find enough tickets for my whole family to see it. So I just went by myself. Um, So I forgot you did that. So that was awesome. And then I also got the opportunity in March to see um, the um, National Ballet of Canada uh, perform in Toronto with my boyfriend. We saw um, some of Crystal Pythe's new work. And that was just really, those two experiences were really special for me just because obviously like we're all craving to see a live performance now. And so I'm, I feel lucky to have had those opportunities um, before everything changed. And then, so that was, that was number one. And then number two would have to probably be starting teaching actually on out school. So I've, I've done, you know, mentoring and, and things in the past, but this thing finally feels like my own, um, like I'm the teacher, I'm not just the assistant. And so that's been really exciting for me. Yeah. I love both of those things and I think it's just super special to one see live performances and kind of see them right up until this all happened similar with my experience kind of like we both had something that we did just before yeah. this all shut down um and then secondly um just being your own kind of teacher and um and having kind of your NYU experience sort of guide you into your new out school um, business. Is that real? Is that what it is? Yeah. Is it- I, my parents always kind of joke that like, in a way I'm my own, like I'm an entrepreneur, which I mean, yeah. it's through another organization, but I'm, I kind of market myself and I'm my own entity and I get to put out what right. I want to offer and how much I want to charge and all of that. So Yeah. Right. So it's almost as if both experiences with your master's degree and with this new out schooling that you're doing is very complementary of each other. And I think that's super, super cool and honestly great that you're doing all of that during this uncertain time, you know? Yeah, no, totally. And I I even notice a big improvement from when I first started with out school back in end of May, early June to now, like 
totally, totally different. Yeah, you're <laughs> so, probably just more comfortable with it. And yeah. So it's really cool to see how what I've been learning has kind of translated into that. Awesome. That makes me really happy to hear. So now looking forward to this year, 2021, it's still, there's so many things that are very much up in the air in the dance world, but what is one personal dance kind of goal that you have that you'd like to accomplish this year? Yeah. So I would say that a huge goal of mine is to eventually move to New York City and be on my own and dance in person with the, with Lori Bellove and the Zdor Duncan Dance Company, as well as just being in other classes in the city and like dancing with people again. Um, that's definitely a major goal I have as of right now, just because everything currently is so virtual, as we talked about in our last episode. Um, so that's probably what I'm most looking forward to. And then hopefully performing eventually. Awesome. Oh, yeah, I think for me, it's it's kind of similar, but it's actually a very small goal because I'm at this point where I just, I want something that's attainable <laughs> and I don't want to be too hopeful about what life might be like and kind of set myself up for more disappointment. So yeah, that's my so goal funny. is very small and it is to just take an in-person class, um, dance class, I mean, because I have not taken an in-person dance class since last March when um, we went home from from Mercyhurst. And I know so many dancers are back in the studio right now and that's amazing and they're able to do what they're doing safely. But unfortunately, I've just not had the opportunity because um, NYU is remote right now and will be remote for the spring as well as just places are still shut down in the city. I can't take any kind of open classes at Steps on Broadway or anything anywhere like that, um, as well as places locally in Connecticut. Um, I just don't have the access to that right now. So my goal is just purely to, like you said, be surrounded by other humans and be in the dance studio dancing together. And I I feel positive that that, that will come. Soon. Yeah, that's a great goal. And I think <laughs> it's very realistic of you and I think it will happen. So yay for yeah. yeah, it'll be an exciting day. <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, so today we're going to talk about dance on film and what that looks like in television series, as well as documentaries and movies. Is there anything you want to add? <laughs> no, I think that's that's pretty much the gist of it all. I hope that those of you that are listening maybe did a little homework yourself and maybe started watching on point or tiny pretty things some of those newer releases if not we will warn you right now that there will be some spoilers more so with I would say tiny pretty things than necessarily the documentary series (laughs) (laughs) but yeah just just know that we we want you to keep listening but we don't want to ruin things for you (laughs) yeah we don't want to be too much of a spoiler but at the same time how do we talk about it without getting into it? I know, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, so first we'll talk about some documentaries. You want to jump into On Point? Yeah, I think that that's a good starting point. Okay. Uh, starting point. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, oh my gosh. They're back, folks. And that was not even intended. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> also, I'm just going to throw in right now that I always like to make the w- fun of the way Hannah says documentary. She's like from Syracuse and she has a very specific way of saying and apparently people from Syracuse say it like that <laughs> right it's like elementary too we yeah have friends that make fun of me you know aka Kristen who says no it's elementary but it's like no it's elementary people from New York probably get me so if you're listening and you're from New York hopefully you say it the way I say it because I think that's a cool way everyone's opinion on how you say those two words is it's fair enough you know all right so on point so something I loved about the series is it really delve into the lives of like what was it maybe five students five or six students and kind of told their personal stories as well as I just feel like viewers got a taste of what School of American Ballet has to offer the students and what the Nutcracker is like. And, you know, we talked about that last time, how the Nutcracker is such a huge tradition for these kids. 
And what I found to be really interesting in this series is we got to see all the preparation and everything that led up to the big show last year, 2019. And then I remember in the last episode, I think they were then describing how the pandemic kind of changed everything from that time on. Right. No. And it's actually kind of cool. I like watched New York City Ballet's Nutcracker on Marquee TV and they had the 2019 um, version. Oh, that's awesome. So I saw the kids that they were talking yeah, about. I love that. So, yeah. So that was super cool. fun and cool for me to see with my family. Yeah, yeah. For those who maybe even aren't familiar, I think most of you have probably heard of the On Point series or seen it advertised, but it is on Disney Plus. And as Hannah mentioned, it It's just all about the School of American Ballet in New York City, which is the school attached to New York City Ballet. And it follows, interestingly, a group, I would say, of young children for the majority of the documentary. But there's also some parts where it highlights some of the students in kind of the upper division. Some of them got offered their apprenticeship into New York City Ballet, which is kind of the main goal during the documentary. And a big shout out to our friend Ellen, a graduate from Mercyhurst, and actually also a graduate from the NYU program that I am pursuing right now as well. She has a little cameo in it because she works for the School of American Ballet and actually recently got a promotion. So congrats, oh, Ellen. Oh, Ellen. Yeah, she's awesome. And I got so excited when I saw her pop up on camera. So did I. I texted you. I was like, yeah. my Ellen. And you were like, yeah, she's she's there. So that's so awesome, Ellen. Yes. Shout out to you if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. And I I briefly um just like exchanged a message or two with her. And I she said something along the lines of that, you know, they were supposed to kind of follow some of the older students more throughout the series, but as as Hannah stated the very last episode, it just kind of got cut short because of the pandemic and they had to stop filming, which honestly for me, that really hit home when that part of the episode happened. It just, it took me back to when we were all experiencing that and kind of the naivety behind it too. You know, all the students, they thought they were going home for like two weeks and they, some of them discussed how they didn't pack all that much. They just packed, you know, a quick bag or two and hopped on a plane and went back home to wherever that was. And I, I don't know, it just, it just took me back to all of that. But anywho. The shock of it all. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate that they weren't able to continue the series. I, I don't know how much more they were necessarily planning to do, but who knows, maybe down the road, they'll do like a season to kind of thing or something. Um, I would definitely be interested in that. Me too. Me too. I thought it was a great series overall. Definitely something to look into if you're interested in learning more about New York City Ballet and the school behind it. I also really liked learning about the the teachers that coach the students mm. at the school. I thought that was also a nice touch with them and learn what they do. Yeah, I would say SAB is unique too in that I believe that all of the faculty there are either former or current um, dancers of New York City Ballet. It's a very kind of tight-knit community there. Maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but basically people just kind of keep cycling through. Like Mm -hmm. ideally a student starts young in the school and then their dream is to get into the company. And then many of the company dancers then kind of get recycled back in through teaching and in different positions in the company. So I think that's interesting about um, New York City Ballet and SAB specifically. I agree. Very interesting. And it really kind of shows that family-like community, that circle. And I feel like in a lot of dance companies and schools, you do have that tight-knit group, but I think it's very special when you have um, mentors that were from the company, you know, especially as young kids, like that's your dream. You want to become a dancer in New York City Ballet and you have your teachers and um, honestly, you get to perform with the company if you're a little kid in the Nutcracker. You get to see all of the company dancers performing and you just want to be like them when you grow up. So I just think that's super great. It's inspiring. Yeah, it really is. And actually, so you brought up, which I think is an interesting point. I'm curious how you feel about this too. I I think it's very interesting. So the children at SAB 
are allowed to be in the Nutcracker, but yet the older students are not. So it's really just the younger students and the company dancers. And I just think that's so interesting because normally you think of kind of you build your way up to something, but for these kids, it's like they start out so young and there's this dream kind of of being in the Nutcracker, then it's achieved. And um, as we learned in the series, a big reason why children don't get casted at a certain point is because of their height. So there was, um, I remember one of the young girls, she was basically saying that when you're in the audition, that all you want is not to be tall, which is, is interesting hearing a young child kind of speak in that way and kind of starting to, in a way, discuss body types in a different kind of way. But I think it's very interesting because it's like you start young, like I said, then you achieve that goal. And then you have, you have other goals throughout the school and they have other performing opportunities, but then you can't really start dancing in the Nutcracker again until you hit being an apprentice for the company. So I just think that that's interesting how that works and really cool though, that those young children do get that opportunity. And I really liked following their specific stories and their family dynamics. And I was impressed by how often some of these young kids were going to class. Some of them only nine years old or so going like five days a week, which is very impressive. And some of the families, the commutes they had to make and the sacrifices. And it was just really, really cool to see. Yeah, I think as a young dancer, it's so important to have that support system of your family. And if the whole family isn't directly involved with your dancing, it's hard to to make the commute and to make the classes that you're hoping to to go to. Um, Just because dance is so disciplined and you have to be there and you have to train. And if your family's not all in with you, it it becomes hard. So I agree. It was super cool to see the parents and even the siblings of the the kids. Yeah I loved how they like took interest in the siblings which I thought was interesting in this specific series. Normally I feel like they're kind of just on the back burner maybe you know you see their face or whatever in a shot but the siblings got to even speak a little bit too which was cool but did you know I didn't know this but I feel like I should have known this that the children get paid for being in the Nutcracker I knew that they had some sort of contract, but I didn't know specifically if they got paid for it, but that's very cool. Yeah. I, now that I think about it all, it just makes more sense to me, but I guess I just didn't realize that initially, which I think is really interesting because in a way that's like their first professional contract. But I think at the same time, it's also very necessary because they did highlight the amount of sacrifices that families have to make and so at the end of the end of the day I think that money is kind of more for the families than the student per se you know to help pay for their tuition or the just the transportation or whatever it is that they they have expenses for yeah it's but, a good sacrifice when you think about it definitely so, yeah so I agree that's cool that they're paying the kids and the families for what they're doing There are two specific things that I really did want to bring up about this documentary in particular. So there was this one quote, very short, just uh, ballet is an unforgiving art form. And during the initial audition, so they showed all of the, the children coming in from all around New York and stuff auditioning to become a part of the school. The One of the SAB New York City ballet teachers or whoever she was exactly, I don't remember her position. She said that by age six or seven, she's able to see what it takes to be a classical ballet dancer. And I didn't love this quote in this part of the documentary because I I know where she's coming from and it made sense they were showing the kids you know they tested to see how much natural turnout they had and how arched their feet were and all of these things so obviously yes some people have that natural facility which is going to get them possibly further in their career or specifically with New York City Ballet they have certain standards and they have kind of this balancing body type that they they really striving to achieve yeah like strive for and so it it under I understand it and it makes sense but it also bothered me just because I felt like that was just putting down classical ballet and just saying well okay 
if you don't have this facility, you can't be a classical ballet dancer. It was kind of the way it was worded. Cause you know what, maybe you won't be a classical ballet dancer at New York city ballet, but it doesn't mean you can't be a classical ballet dancer. And just the physique is not all it takes because often you see these very naturally talented dancers who end up getting burned out at a young age. I mean, there's other things like perseverance and work ethic and discipline, um, so much more that goes into it. So that that was just something where I was I was watching and I was kind of like, mm. luckily there weren't too many other moments <laughs> when watching that I felt that way. But that was one thing that stuck out for me. I I see where you're coming from with that, and I think the same woman said like usually I know who's going to make it, but I'm not always right. And sometimes I'm not right. And I think that kind of brings up your point, Kristen. Um, you can't always tell from that young age. No, right. It's so much about determination and passion. I feel like if you don't have the, the love for it, are you really going to be able to make it your career? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I agree. And then I also thought it was interesting, so how they called it like nutcracker casting versus it was not an audition and they kind of spoke about this. And I just, I've never experienced anything like this before. So I thought it was interesting how the children found out in the moment they would go into the studio and they would learn a piece of choreography. So they would go in for a specific thing. They'd go in for the candy canes or party scene and they were told right then and there whether they got the part or not. So they had a couple rounds of eliminating people, which is typical of an audition. Auditions do have rounds where they eliminate people. But I feel like normally in a, an audition, you might have an idea towards the end. You know, if you've made it to the last round, okay, well, I, I stand a chance. But usually you don't hear until after the fact you receive an email or a phone call or a letter in the mail, something along the lines of that. But I just thought it was so interesting, the idea of like a casting call where they just find out right then and there. And as you could see, the kids then go out in the lobby and they're either super excited and they're hugging their parents and their friends, or you have the disappointed ones and having those kind of mixed emotions in the same room can be challenging, especially with with children who can't necessarily hide it as much. And kind of going off of that, Sophia, one of the main students, the documentary was talking about and following she got casted as Marie which is one of the main parts you can have if not the main part as a child in the Nutcracker for New York City Ballet and for just you know Nutcrackers in general but for the longest time she kept saying oh I want this part I want this part and she never actually got the part that she wanted but then at the very end they said you're the new Marie of 2019 yeah and then she was super excited and it just goes to to show you like how casting can kind of turn out and it is interesting as you just pointed out to Kristen um that this was an an audition for casting a role not so much I don't know it was like you kind of had an idea like you were saying you have an idea sort of maybe if you make it to the last round that you got the part but you don't necessarily know what part until maybe later on but the difference is these kids find out right then and there that same day and hey lucky them because I remember as a kid growing up anxiety yeah more so I'd say maybe middle school high school time but that like week or week and a half of waiting for the cast list to come out oh my gosh that was Percy Hurst we felt that way remember yeah yeah no I agree I think for me like the stakes were a little higher back in high school personally because at Mercyhurst there was so many talented people where I knew like okay I can expect a core kind of role in whatever ballet or show we were doing whereas in high school I trained at a lot um smaller of a like school company so I actually had an opportunity to perform some leading roles and so I think for me then it was there was a lot more at stake, whereas at Mercy Hearst, I was kind of you had an ethically able to expect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. But but yeah, definitely. I mean, in general, even just with summer in- intensive auditions or um, I mean, company auditions, anything, just that waiting is so anxiety provoking, and it feels like an eternity, even though in reality it's usually like a week or two. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about specifically with On Point? 
Nothing super specific. I just, I really enjoyed it for anyone who's interested. If you haven't seen it, I mean, because really it's not like we spoiled very much for this. It's fairly lighthearted. It's just enjoyable. You can see the pure joy of the children and the older students. And my heart was so happy for the girls who got promoted. It's just, it's really, really a nice documentary. I think it was well done. My only critique would be overall that it was a bit too glorified and perfect. I mean, they definitely highlighted challenges of the students, you know, having to be far away from home for the first time and away from family and different things like that and how that can all be difficult. But at the same time, just from the reputation of the School of American Ballet and New York City Ballet, I don't think it's all fun and dandy all the time. I think that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes there as well. Not not to say it's a horrible place. That's not what I mean. But I mean, there's a lot more that we don't necessarily. There's a lot more. And especially even just things that have popped up in the news over the years, more so with the company, I mean, than the school. And this was focusing on the school. But I just I think it painted a very pretty picture for ballet. And sometimes we do need that a little bit. But I don't know. It's just, it's, you don't get the balance there. So that's my only critique is you don't see so much the hardships. I mean, it's a, it's a Disney plus <laughs> uh, documentary series. So at the same time, I wouldn't really expect anything different, but yeah, that's just my thought on that. Yeah. You know, I didn't even really think about that so much until now when you're bringing it up, but I, I would agree with that statement. I I think there is so much that goes into this beautiful art form. Dance is like stunning, but also the hard work and the and the blood, sweat, and tears literally that go into things that go into dancing. Um, I think that could have been portrayed a little bit more in this series, just because it isn't like you said, like oh, it's all great and rainbows are everywhere and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ballet every day. And while that is true, it's not completely accurate to a good realistic portrayal of what dancers go through definitely and I think honestly we'll probably be able to discuss this further towards the end of the episode but I think the way ballet is portrayed in the media and all these movies tv shows documentaries there's a struggle for balance it's like one extreme or the other it's like right everything is pink and perfect and beautiful or it's like oh my gosh dancers are insane and mentally not okay in any capacity yeah. it's like one or the other so yeah right it's finding that balance I think this brings us to documentaries in general when you look at um ballet 422 or even on mm-hmm. point or I'm sorry not on point first position you do see a little bit of both but I think in yeah. general, this series, it was like very much. It's, it's very glorified. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually though, I, I wanted to bring up first position because I would argue as much as I just said that I think that across the board, there's a lack of balance. I think first position actually does right. That's a fairly I'm- nice job of that. <laughs> I, I love that documentary. I remember first seeing it in the theater years ago with my dance friends from um, where I I trained growing up and we were so excited for it. And I remember that year for Christmas, I asked for it on DVD and I pretty much forced, um, I'd say many people to watch it with me following that. Once I had it on DVD, I would watch it over and over. Um, There's just so many great things about it. I'm so if you watched it like 10 times in a row during that first year it came out like I was upset yeah and I'm to- like like you I was like anyone needs to anyone who likes dance or is interested about dance needs to watch this because it's so cool <laughs> and honestly I would still argue that like if someone was interested in looking for something to watch and they just wanted to learn more about ballet specifically I would yeah, probably like too. yeah I'd probably recommend that to them for sure because so if if you're not familiar with first position it follows a group of students 
or dancers, I guess I should say, as they perform in the Youth American Grand Prix around the world. Um, so the Youth American Grand Prix is the largest ballet competition um, internationally. And so all the different people who competed um, were from different spots in the world and they followed them around. It did come out in 2012. I did my little bit of research because I was curious with some of these different movies and documentaries as we discussed them and how they differ if having when they came out has anything to do with perhaps the way dance is portrayed and if that's changed over time. So this is a bit of an older documentary, but I mean, you definitely see so many positives of dance in this series. You get to see just the pure joy of the dancers as they perform, as they make friends. I think of little Aaron Bell and Gaia, um, their adorable little relationship in the movie and how just dance can bring people together. I mean, you see the success of the dancers and from the competition itself, because you can win scholarships or um, contracts to companies if you're old enough. And so there, there's so many positives of it, but at the same time, you see the grit of it all. Um, it really takes you through the training process for the competition we see things like Michaela de Prince, they highlight um, and her struggle with her, her mom having to dye all her tutus um, to fit her skin color because um, tutus are really only made for white people. And so that's something that I would say is very relevant to right now, but um, her having to pancake her point shoes and everything and how that's just an additional expense and thing of her time that she has to do or her mom had to do for her and I mean there I just remember like I'm having these flashbacks to little clips of like kids crying backstage you know because they came off stage and they weren't happy with how they performed and that's not unusual I would say that happens often I actually I performed in the in YGP one year and I love this documentary and around that time I wanted to everyone to watch it because I was like I did this I even though I just did it for fun and for the experience I still like wanted people to understand how big of a deal this competition actually is yeah and like even I think of the scene I don't know if you remember this specifically but um it was uh, Miko Fogarty's family and they were discussing, you know, the mom, um, <laughs> mom's kind of funny in general, but how, you know, she had the specific like fat free yogurts and everything for Miko and all of these things. And the girl was nine years old. She was so young and clearly very in shape. She did not need to worry about her body, but just how kind of obsessive her mother was from such a young age. And so it definitely brought up a lot of things. Yeah. And the mom's dynamic with not only Miko, but her brother. Do you remember that whole? Yes. Jules. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> And how she just sort of gave up on him. And she was laughing at him. She was like, yeah, you're you're not going to be like your sister, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was just, there were a lot of very honest moments in that documentary. But it also, it wasn't, ballet is a dumpster fire. It was like, also, here are all these wonderful things. and Yeah. And I thought it did a nice job showing, um, like you said, the, how how they were eating, but also like, how they were doing mentally, their mental health, their physical health, what they were doing to help fuel themselves during the ballet season, during the competition season. Yeah, I just thought it did a really nice job showcasing what YAGP is, and then it kind of showed each dancer's life outside of it as well, and it was very realistic, I felt, so I agree yeah. with the documentary. Totally yeah. recommend. That's a, it's a good one. It really is. Um, more recently, actually, I don't know if you have heard of this one, but on Netflix, it's a Netflix produced documentary. Have you seen it move? I don't think I have. No, I would check that out. Um, <laughs> it's actually, it's a, it's a series, so like on point, but each episode, um, highlights someone else. So it's, it's not all connected. And I actually started watching it last night. <laughs> it was kind of a last minute um, decision. And I'm on episode two right now. And it's, it's cool because 
it looks at all different like genres of dance. The first episode was um, looking at Lil Buck, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. And it was very much about street dancing and popping, which is always interesting for me to learn a little bit more about because I, I don't know a ton about that kind of world and then I'm currently in the middle of the second episode um, featuring Ohad Noreen and the um, Batsheva Dance Company in um, Tel Aviv, Israel and I'm really enjoying that episode so far and I think that I think Hannah you specifically would would really like that episode. Yeah Um, I remember in school we watched uh, something about him as well. Do you remember that? Yeah, the, the like Gaga documentary. Yep, I think, yep. I think it may have been on Netflix as well at some point. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, uh, I I do remember watching that. I'll definitely have to check this out. Thank you for telling me this, Kristen. Yeah, and you too, listeners. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Um, I, it's still a work in progress for me. I've I've been busy with some different things, but I recently discovered it and had to give it a give it a try. And I know this is also, I mean, a little different, but the same topic of a documentary. Restless Creature, the Wendy Whelan documentary, Mm -hmm. and A Ballerina's Tale, I believe that was the one with Misty Copeland. Yeah, Misty Copeland. Mm -hmm. Um, Those two. Also a good book, Misty's Mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So those two, I thought, did a nice job kind of diving into their individual lives as dancers. Yeah. Um, whereas Ballet 422 was about New York City ballet and um, performing, right? I watched that one a while ago. Yeah. I didn't love that one as much, if I'm being completely honest. Um, yeah, it followed specifically um, pieces, oh, Justin Peck, pieces mm-hmm. he, was, right. he was choreographing mm-hmm. and setting on the company. And as much as I love his work, I don't know, just something about it. It just didn't capture my attention as much. It felt a little dry to me personally. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, it's been a while since I watched it. Same here. And I think if we're talking about pieces and how, you know, choreography is a whole nother, whole nother bag of worms that we could talk about at another time. But I think if we're talking about how dance is made on you know, ma- major companies like New York City Ballet. I thought it was an interesting documentary to watch. But if we're really getting into the knit and grit of dance and what people and dancers experience, like from a very personal level, I think Restless Creature and A Ballerina's Tale really dive into that well. Um, yeah. So again, like from my perspective too, Kristen, I would much rather prefer um, well-known professional dancers' life story than a documentary about choreography but then again it's it's what you're interested in and what you're feeling at that point in time and I think Ballet 422 definitely accomplished what it was set up you yeah. know, what to do um I think that's a really good point and I, I think that for me it's a uh, similar reason I think I'm just not I wasn't drawn into it as much because I think I kind of like the ones where you're following someone and you get like there's a real like heart to the story like even with on point even it was following different dancers and same with yeah it's more personal yeah it's more personal and you get attached to them all and you want to see them succeed and you you feel what they're feeling it's just one of those kinds of things <laughs> yeah and I think if you're looking at like principal dancers and companies maybe you don't know so much about their personal life story and their upbringing, but then when, when a documentary is put on, you really see how they got to where they were. And it's not always pretty. It's mm-hmm. not this easy path. And I know for Misty and I think for Wendy, um, it's not just super straightforward and pretty. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of suffering sometimes too, to get to where you are. And I think that's what's so neat about seeing these amazing dancers, you know, like seeing their path, seeing their journey to where they got to at this point in time and this point in their career. So that's something else I really yeah. like too. Now on the flip side of documentaries, now we're not saying that this is the only things that are out, but these are definitely the ones that Chris and I wanted to talk about specifically today, but definitely check out other documentaries too. There's a lot of great ones out on dance that 
everyone should see. But on the flip side of that, we can talk about how dance is in uh, dramas and <laughs> TV, TV dramas, movies, all of that. And with that said, oof, like, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> there's, there's a lot to discuss and unpack here. I think we should start probably with tiny pretty things. I think, do you think that that's a good? Yeah, let's start there. Point? Yeah. So folks, <laughs> for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, Tiny Pretty Things is a Netflix original series. So far, there's one season with 10 episodes, about 50 minutes to one hour each. But based off of the last episode, I feel very confident to say that there will definitely be at least another season because boy was that a cliffhanger and this fictional series follows dancers at the famed quote-unquote archer school of ballet which is based in chicago this is fictional um like i said but also just a little shout out to um lucas de marinas who we went to school with at mercyhurst he was in this series which is super cool i it's so weird that we're talking about two t- Two things, um, two shows that just came out, one on Netflix, one on Disney Plus, both huge platforms. And we literally went to school with someone who was in each of them. I think that's pretty crazy. That is pretty crazy. Every time he came on screen, I paused it and I was like, hey, I watched it with my mom. I was like, mom, see, there's Lucas. (laughs) Yeah, super cool. So I doubt you're listening, but if you are Lucas, um, really, really well done and Um, I didn't really know how much to expect to see you in the series, but he got a lot of camera time. So that's awesome. Congrats. Yeah. And I also just want to talk about, like, speaking of Lucas and the other dancers on screen and even the main characters in this show, I think oftentimes we see other professional dancers coming in as they're like, uh, what's the word? Stunt double. Yes, that's the word, Kristen. That's the word. Yes, and I think what was so neat about this series is all of the dancers, I was reading up on this too, all of them are professional dancers and have experienced dancing and there there wasn't any kind of stunt doubling happening at any point. Yeah, so I know. Cool things, very cool. Yeah, I agree. I did like that about this series in particular because there's nothing worse than like your cheesy Hallmark movie or some random ballet show that comes out and the dancers just can't dance or and sorry I don't mean that harshly but I just mean they don't have the or or rudely I should say I just mean they don't have the 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 proper training really for trying to portray what they're trying to portray Um, or they're a beautiful dancer but the acting is not so good Um, but I I enjoyed with this series that I actually was questioning whether some of them were like an actor first or a dancer first like I was kind of questioning what they consider themselves to be or what was their first kind of focus and maybe they were both they were pursuing them both simultaneously. I don't know. And maybe you know a little bit more, Hannah, about that from what you read up on. But I just was very impressed by the caliber of the dancing in comparison to also their acting. I didn't feel like one was really slacking. Yeah, I don't know too much about that either. But that is something interesting to bring up. Kind of on another note, though, I think if I was like a 10 year old, really inspired by dance as I was at one point, I don't think this is the show necessarily to watch. No, we're going to throw that out there right now. Do not show this to your young cousin or your niece or your nephew. Or I could totally totally see a kid being like, mom, this show is about dance. Like I want to watch it. Yeah. Not the show. No, this is not the show. There's a lot of as we could say, mature content in this TV show. And what I do think is a little problematic is that, you know, it is on Netflix and a lot of young kids do have access to Netflix. And of course, like you said, Hannah, I mean, if I heard, or even if my parents heard like, oh, there's a 
a ballet show coming out and it sounds kind of cute like tiny pretty things like it sounds innocent it is not innocent so I just think too that you know despite the fact that there is a rate it's rated as being mature and having mature yeah, I think it's PVMA so it is yeah you pointed that out to me which it, it surely should be but I think that there's also the potential for so it falling into the wrong hands and a lot of young children perhaps seeing it by accident or starting to watch it until an adult realizes maybe this is not a good idea. But in general, just kind of to dive into a bit more about it, it is a very dark portrayal of ballet. And I, I think we would not advise this for young audiences, partly because of that, in addition to just other things that in any TV show is just not appropriate for for young children but it really dives into different issues in the dance world such as eating disorders sexual abuse power positions and hierarchy injuries and trying to work through injuries and most oftenly not working through them in a healthy manner and just trying to push through things like drugs favoritism there's really really a lot going on in the series they didn't just pick one thing to oh, yeah. no it was like all of these things that are real issues in the dance world like you know definitely those things are happening and did happen and still do happen but they definitely exaggerated the content and made it very dark in a lot of ways and it's hard because once again you know we talked about the need for balance but nowadays something like a tv drama which this definitely is i mean things are blown out of proportions i have to admit i was a sucker for guilty pleasures of mine growing up were pretty little liars and more recently i don't love it but i i did get sucked in riverdale and i think that these are two great examples of things that just aren't realistic especially you know in both plots they're high school aged people and so many of the things that are happening are just not realistic yeah, right beyond this their age, age group to be dealing yeah. with like yeah. murders and all of these like just crazy things but I would say that this show is kind of like your equal to like it's like the dance version of like Pretty Little Liars or Riverdale and yeah. I understand them wanting that drama kind of component but it then creates some issues for the dance world, I feel like. Yeah, and I think something really poignant to talk about is just, you know, and this is kind of sad, but if you're not someone who really loves dance or is a dancer yourself or a performer or an artist, you're not necessarily going to be drawn to a documentary, you know? What sells is this crazy, dramatic stuff. And although I see why you know, producers and other companies are sharing this kind of stuff and making this kind of stuff and projecting it on a big platform like Netflix. I don't necessarily think this is the right way to do it because in society, we're going to view dance maybe in the wrong light. And Mm -hmm. even though it does sell, is that really what we're trying to portray? Yeah. So that's what I have trouble with sometimes when I'm thinking about shows like this and, and movies too, you know, it's a little too much. And although it sells, is that really what we're trying to say? Right. I completely agree with that, Hannah. And I I feel torn to some extent about the series because I do like that it highlights some of these issues because... Um, it's not glorified like we talked about with some documentaries or on point how it paints this perfect picture, which I think is good. I I like that some issues are, are being highlighted, but at the same time, it's not the way it's showing all these different things. Like no one's trying to correct any of these issues other than I would say, you know, obviously they, they are trying to kind of all rebel against Madame Dubois and, you know, the issues with um, sexual abuse and the company and um, all of that. I mean, that definitely, I like that the students kind of put up a fight for that, even if it's 
in kind of an unrealistic way of, you know, changing the choreography on, or on stage or having voiceovers, like that would not, that would not fly at most places. That was a very bold kind of dramatic thing that occurred. But other than that, we don't really see anyone fighting for any of these other issues. Like we have Bet, for example, who deals with horrible injuries um, throughout the show and she just pushes through them. She takes drugs to try to ease the pain and be able to just keep pushing through. And it's not just any kind of drug. It's like narcotics. Yeah, no, it's hard drugs. I'm not just talking like <laughs> popping an Advil or two. Like, no, no. And what I I think is problematic about all of this, and of course, to have the drama component, maybe you do need some of that, but I just think it's problematic because you have young dancers, even middle school or high school age, I would still consider that a young dancer, who they're seeing they're seeing this kind of thing and they might think it's okay. Like they might see someone like Bet working through an injury and think, well, it's okay. Like she did that and she got away with it and she got to perform a leading role. Like there's just a lot of bad examples in this or, you know, even the way like body image is looked at in the show and everything. It just, it doesn't set a good precedent and not enough is done in the show yeah for it to be like no this is not good right right and also I feel at least no I I fully concur (laughs) I fully agree with you I I was also just thinking now too about just the relationships between the students and the adult figures like whether it be a parent and a daughter or it's the head of the school and a student it's just so many of the relationships got so blurred and some of these relationships were really unhealthy and not okay and yet it wasn't addressed Mm -hmm. and that's also kind of scary too (laughs) yeah Um, I think we do see a little bit of a fight with some of the relationships like June for example and her mom um she kind of had a breakthrough but it was a very extreme breakthrough you know she tried to get emancipated from her her mother and it kind of took that to get her mom to like believe in her and trust her and want to see her dance and all these things and I mean even at the end too with Bet and her mother kind of that scene that they had in the kitchen at her boyfriend's house I I, I think there were some breakthroughs and and I think that that's good but like you said there were so many pro- problematic relationships yeah and things that weren't yes. addressed you know yeah just stuff that kind of happened and then I was like all right um I don't like, know if that was something that should have been uh just kind of passed passed by and kind of forgotten about because I feel like a lot of things that happened in the show is like one crazy thing happened and then we kind of forgot about it and we went on to something else you know yeah that so, that's so true a couple quotes I wrote down from this series um, that stuck out to me were even magic comes at a price and in it's an ugly business making something so beautiful, which um, is very similar to just the common phrase that like pain is beauty. But those no stood doubt. out to me in terms of what this series is kind of about because, you know, saying something like, it's an ugly business making something so beautiful. I don't totally disagree with that, but also like, it doesn't have to be, but that's the way they choose to make it be. Right. Like on the flip side, there, there was some accurate things that I felt I related to even, and especially with some of the, the quotes or like the, the talking over by Nevea at the beginning of a lot of each episodes, I, I could relate to a lot of the things she was saying. And I felt like yes I also have experienced that or I see where she's coming from but I also think some of the things some of the quotes that were said later on maybe that's true for some places but not for all and I think that's kind of what you're getting at because yeah. dance, dance is it, it can be kind of tough and rough around the edges in companies and schools but that's not happening everywhere 
And I think that's something that audiences have to be aware of that maybe this is talked about and shown in this one uh, documentary or TV series, but that doesn't mean that it's true for everything and everyone everywhere, you know? Or even if it is true, which it definitely is in some places, like the ballet world is tough. It, it really is. And there, there are ish- dance world, dance. Yeah, world. No, that you're so right. The dance world in general, but since this was, you know, based on ballet show I I think there are some things that are more specific to ballet in terms of of issues that exist but I mean even though it it does exist places in a way it could be a form of advocacy because yeah it might not be like that everywhere but you know what there are probably plenty of places that maybe not maybe remove like the murder and drama and getting pushed off the edge of a building, all of like, all of that kind of stuff and just narrow it down to everything else. I I would say that a lot of that exists elsewhere, but it can be used in a positive way in terms of like advocacy and making a change because like we're at this point, I feel like, I feel like we're at a rather pivotal point in the ballet world specifically where people are starting to speak out a little bit more and be like, this is a problem and this needs to change. And I just don't feel like this show quite did that. It definitely brings to light issues, but just the way like we've discussed that it was portrayed, I don't necessarily feel like it's in a form of like advocacy. <laughs> yeah, which is, I know in my perspective, it was kind of quite frustrating to be completely honest. You know, I, I felt like it was a lot of dark, things that kept being brought up not a lot of things were being done to change the way it was being yeah it's like mediate it all yeah it was yeah so you know like I think the dancing in the the series was great but do I think this is a great show that portrays ballet well not necessarily Mm -hmm. yes it had some positive components and it brought to light as you said some major issues that are happening in the ballet world specifically but I just didn't necessarily find that it was super productive, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to put it, actually, because I'd be lying if I didn't say I enjoyed it to some extent. Like I said, I'm a sucker for some of these dramas, and I totally got sucked in. And when it finished, I was like, all right, I'm ready for season two. Like, let's go. So don't get me wrong. Like, I didn't not enjoy it. Like, I, I would say I got sucked in, but at the same time, there are many issues and and like you said I, I wouldn't say it's a positive thing necessarily for the ballet world but at the same time the dancing was gorgeous for people who don't know much about dance at least I'm happy that they're seeing such real dancing dancers. yeah 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 um, that's that is really cool especially knowing to like knowing that we know one of them and that maybe all the rest of them like are around our age and stuff too it's kind of cool but I did some research they're all like 23 24 a lot wow. of them about our age yeah so pretty cool yeah I love that actually so just talking about the characters in general I am curious if you have a a favorite character and then b if you were to be in the show theoretically which character would you want to play okay so if I had to answer this I would say that the character that I like most and the one that I would want to play is probably Nevea just because I really liked the things that she stood for and I also just thought she was a powerful woman you know like I love that and I thought that was really really cool and um, I just thought her character was very important to the show, and I think she was sort of an outcast compared to the rest of the the dancers in in the school. And I don't know. I just I thought that it was cool. She was very much her own person. She wasn't really complying to what everyone else was doing. She was. She was just her her own being, and I really, really liked that. So, yeah. How about you? I I actually had mixed feelings about Nevaeh's character, if I'm being completely honest. That's okay. I, 
disagree. I think she had her strong, like powerful moments, but I also felt like she kind of got lost a little in the show. Like okay. I felt like at first, you know, this was going to be the show about her. I do think she has some powerful moments, like bringing everyone together to fight for a purpose. But at other moments, I felt like she kind of just got like sucked into some of the drama, but they all kind of did. So I would say actually my favorite character, I I feel like it's kind of random, but I really loved Oren. I just, yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I just really liked him and I felt like he was one of the more like genuine people on the show. Whereas a lot of the others had it out for someone or just got wrapped up into all this drama and like causing problems. And with him, not to say that he's perfect or anything, but I just felt like he was more pure and genuine than a lot of the other characters. I so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's kind of a tough call, but I, he was kind of one of my favorites, I think. Okay. Nice, nice. And who would you want to be if you were in the show Him this, well? no no <laughs> <laughs> I I had to think about this one for a little bit but I actually think that I'd want to play June I like her character and I also feel like she's strong like very independent female I mean she tried to emancipate herself from her mother and I feel like she has a couple moments where she stands up for herself really well especially towards the end well, and you can just for, tell how much she loves dance. Like pasta. Yeah. 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 She she has a strong passion. Like I feel like she's there at the school for the right reasons. She's an absolutely gorgeous dancer. And I feel like she's also somewhat of an underdog. Like she's so beautiful, but she's not necessarily given everything that she deserves. And I I kind of really respect that and almost feel like I can relate to that to some extent. Then, like I'm not saying oh I'm amazing and I should get all these amazing things and I haven't that's not what I mean but I just the idea of being an underdog I kind of like relate to a little bit in some ways and yeah I just I love the way she stands up for herself like against her mother and everything and I just I just think she'd be fun to play mm-hmm. I could see that nice nice Although <laughs> you probably would have expected this answer from me. I don't take back June. June is my answer, but I had moments where I was like, it would be fun to play bet, but that's just like a lot. <laughs> oh my gosh. That would be a lot. I can't that's a lot. <laughs> out to her, like to the, to the woman who played her, because that is quite a lot to endure. <laughs> <in the future. laughs> oh my gosh. But going off of tiny, pretty things, I have heard from other dancers, and I know, Kristen, you watched Ballet Academy. I think there are some similarities in the show. I think also a movie we could talk about in comparison to this series is Black Swan. You know, I just, I think that's, yeah, you know. Black Swan came out, since I did my research, in 2010. And 10 years later, with Tiny Pretty Things coming out, I would basically just say it's like the modern version of Black Swan. (laughs) in tv form in a lot of ways I mean but there's definitely a lot of similarities right and to be completely honest I don't think I would have watched Black Swan if Christine didn't say Hannah were watching this um because I'm not a huge horror film kind of girl I am not really about that I'd say it's maybe a bit more of a thriller person okay fine (laughs) regardless it wasn't going to be something I would watch on my own but I was persuaded to watch it and I I am glad that I watched it I could see some of the the themes and the different topics the director was exploring in this film you know it was a very interesting film to say the least but scary also (laughs) and that's probably not the best for younger audiences yeah not the best for younger audiences but it definitely had some moments where I was like, yeah, that definitely happens in the dance world. And it's definitely, definitely accurate. I mean, but yeah, it's also at times blown a little bit out of proportion. 
sophomore year of college I practically begged Hannah and um our other roommate Stacy to watch it with me I had seen it already I watched it back in I think I was high school um actually with my my dance friends once again in my my basement we were having a sleepover um but I I will admit that I kind of like dark and creepy things so I sometimes gravitate towards them and so Black Swan did fulfill some of that for me. And that's why I was like, guys, like, you have to watch this. And of course, it's dance related too. Yeah. And shout out to Sarah Lane because that was. Yes. Um, shout out to Sarah Lane. And I think important. that literally ties in to what I was just going to say, Hannah, is unlike Tiny Pretty Things, where you mentioned that all of the dancing and acting is done by the same people in Black Swan, there's, um, if you're not. If you're not familiar with this, there's just been a lot of controversy over it surrounding the fact that the actress, um, Natalie Portman, had a stunt double, Sarah Lane, of American Ballet Theater, and that she didn't get enough credit and this and that. And um, credit is a big thing in, in the dance world, whether it's choreography, whether it's a dancer, whoever, whoever you are credit must be given where credit is due and so I I understand why there has been such a big controversy over it but it's cool to see the same person doing both as much as Sarah Lane's dancing was beautiful and the acting was also great um also I don't know still enough about the background of the actors and dancers from Tiny Pretty Things which I'm realizing now like I just want to do more research on it but I also think it's cool that I don't necessarily think that any of those dancers are a part of like a major company or anything like that. Whereas obviously like they brought in Sarah Lane, someone from ABT, one of the most well-known companies. And I think it's kind of cool that we got to see dancers who maybe are just doing some freelance type projects or just kind of starting out their, their professional work. It's just cool too. Yeah, definitely. Now segueing into another dance film, Center Stage pretty iconic yes yes I haven't seen that one in a in a couple years I think that one came out in 2000 and that that I would say is one that more non-dancers have likely seen would you agree with that I would agree and I think unlike some of the other shows and movies that we were talking about prior I think center stage does do a pretty nice job showing the reality of ballet and also kind of showing the the drama too like I think there was a nice balance in this film and there was also some really really nice dancing yes very nice dancing and yeah I I think Hannah you're right I think there's a fair amount of balance in that and especially that this movie uh dates us back 20 years I think even more so it was very well done because Mm -hmm. obviously so much has changed um, within that time and we've progressed in a different kind of way. But for 20 years ago, especially, I think it was very well done and and fairly balanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought that was great. You know, there's been some other films like Step Up and Flashdance, Footloose, Red Sparrow. We have a bunch of dance being- There is an- abundance ah. <laughs> yes 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 you know there's dance shown in all of these films and whether the acting and the dancing are up to par that's I think for you as an audience member to decide but I definitely think that there are some pretty awesome dancers in all of those films that I just mentioned and I think that's really really cool like I love to see some great dancing done by professional people Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I like center stage and tiny pretty things again going back to that Mm -hmm. just because it was so real and so honest and you can totally see just the work and the beauty in the dancing portrayed so that's my two cents on that (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and I don't know if you noticed this but I feel like more and more of these kinds of shows and movies keep coming out I feel like in pop culture right now, dance is considered somewhat in and has been for a little while now and that there's this fascination with 
even like ballet specifically, because I think we keep seeing ballet kind of popping up. Right. In these- yeah. And that's actually something I wanted to talk to you about, Kristen. I was thinking a lot about this before our episode. And not to say that modern dance and um, jazz and tap and other forms of dance aren't being exemplified in like the media and on film. But I would say that ballet seems to be the one that's getting all the attention. And also, I think hip hop dance too has been mm-hmm. getting portrayed in street dance, but maybe not in the correct light. I think hip hop generates from culture. And mm-hmm. we see a lot of hip hop dancers and street dancers that aren't really part of that culture. Maybe they're, they're white people doing mm-hmm. hip hop street dance, and maybe that's not correct. And yeah and I was just thinking a lot about that and I think again it goes to like are we showing a realistic portrayal of dance or is it just kind of this glorified thing that we're trying to to sell right like what is your opinion on that would you agree like maybe it's not always um shown in the best light yeah I would I would agree with that I think kind of going back (laughs) of our discussions we've already had you're likely to see a more honest and accurate representation in my opinion in a documentary than yes yes, the tv shows and movies and I think a lot of that is surrounding like you've mentioned what sells I think that unfortunately in fictional work there's always going to be that that extra element of like Will this sell? What do we need to add? What do we need to change? Yeah. So I I think too, like you said, you brought up like street dancing and everything. The first episode I watched um, of the documentary series Move, I think highlighted street dancing very well. Um, I mean, I don't know a ton about it, but like you said, it's a very cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And And I would say that is the same with I think that that was portrayed very well and they highlighted the right people for that episode. But whereas in movies and stuff, like I I don't remember what it's called, but there was this movie I watched actually like a couple weeks ago on Netflix. You know, I was just, just looking for something kind of lighthearted to watch and oh my gosh, I'm completely blanking on what it was called, but basically this girl, she starts her own troupe. What? Was it Leap? The cute little cartoon? No, it wasn't Leap. (laughs) Like these high school aged people. And this girl, she's trying to get into, I think it's Dartmouth or some really good school, but her interview didn't really go well. And so she was trying to make herself seem more appealing as a candidate and so she said she was a part of like the dance team at school and but she in reality didn't have any dance experience and so she tried to audition and she didn't make the cut and so then she was super gung-ho and like I'm gonna create my own dance team and brought together a group of misfits and they somehow got someone famous to choreograph for them and help train that it's one of those kinds of things and their style was more hip-hop But like you said, it was completely like out of context, you know, just this group of misfits from high school, not, not knowing anything really about hip hop other than just trying to like mimic certain moves and stuff. And it, it was, I, it was cute. Like it was, like I said, I was just looking for something lighthearted to watch, but at the same time, I think that that's an example of yet another like poor portrayal if we're talking about doing dance justice across different forms of media oh I was also just thinking about how so many non-dancers know of dance moms and like yes and dancing with the stars all of those things are very fascinating shows but I mean maybe they don't necessarily do the concert dance side of things well I think that's another example that we can pull from like for example for dancing with the stars and so you think you can dance a lot of it is for show like what are we putting on stage is this something is this entertaining enough for people to watch 
yet we're not really doing shows about really cool choreography and you know maybe that's also because of liability and different things like that and copyright but maybe it would be super cool if we looked into American Ballet Theater and the Jose Limon Dance Company and Lori Bell Love and Isadora Duncan Dance Company and Lines and all of these different complexions. What if we had a show dedicated to companies, dance companies around the country and around the world? Maybe that would be something to show and to give the non-dancer population something to, to see because a lot of times people only know like, oh, Abby Lee, like, oh, that is that what you do is that the kind of dancing thing you do? or can you do the splits or can you do fouettes like uh, there are very mainstream things that so many people know about that aren't necessarily like what dance is and I end up I don't know if you also experience this experience this Kristen but I end up having to explain to people what I actually do and a lot of times I think society projects it wrong <laughs> oh yeah I mean I still get asked like oh, are you going to stay in New York and, like, audition for Broadway? And it's like, I'm a classically trained ballet dancer. Not to say, like, some ballet dancers don't dance on Broadway and everything, but it's just this, like, a lot of people, you know, just don't understand. And these can be potential opportunities to help people understand. But going back to what you were saying about, you know, highlighting these different companies and stuff, there actually was one show that did exist. Did you ever watch Breaking Point? No, there is a show out there. Cool. Breaking Point followed Ballet West, which I kind of have like a little infatuation with them. Oh, wait um, a minute. Yes, yes, yes. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, because I, I attended their summer intensive and I like <laughs> loved watching the show. I watched their Nutcracker the other night. Like I I kind of am a little bit obsessed with the company. Um and the lovely Tana Hunter, yeah. our former department chair, was a principal dancer there. But well, that's definitely our cool connection to them. For yeah, sure. but um, Ballet West is located out in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's one of the larger, more well-known ballet companies over out on the West Coast. And um, yeah, there was a TV series. I'm trying to remember, probably around like freshman, sophomore year of high school for us was when it premiered it was on like cable tv and um I followed it very religiously I thought overall it was a pretty good show there was definitely like they focused on relationships inside the company and stuff which I think was a bit of them trying to attract people to the show because I think it was one of those shows that mostly dancers watched not so much people outside the dance world yeah, but that interesting it's how can we find that balance you know how can we yeah. give dance justice while also making it like entertaining for the mm -hmm. non-dancer population it's something to grapple with and I think it would be really interesting in these you know next couple of years or you know in the future if we can get more shows and movies made on really awesome dance companies yeah I think there's a lot more to come because like I said I think there is this fascination with dancers that exists um in our general society and I mean I was shocked that these two huge things tiny pretty things and on point both literally premiered around the same time like to me that was kind of shocking I don't know if anything had to do with the pandemic um and you know on point stopping its filming earlier or just this like feeling that there was a need for the dance like for something for the dance world so I don't I don't know why these both premiered when they did but I think that that's just an example that there's going to be a lot more to come and I'm interested to see where it continues to take us all right so if you have not watched literally any of the things we discussed today, I I would recommend it. That way, at least, even if it wasn't our favorite thing, you can understand a little bit more where we're coming from and start having a critical eye, like I feel like we did today, or at least are trying to do. Yeah. Um, and we're also not trying to say like, oh, this show's bad, this show's great. It's more of just from our own perspective. And our Absolutely. Own You're entitled to your own opinion, um, as are we, <laughs> and we shared ours. You were totally able to feel 
what you want to feel about these shows. But yeah, I think just going in with a critical eye is important though, because yeah, and we have conversations about them. We can't just look at these things surface level. There's, there's a lot to unpack. Yes. Very, very true, Kristen. Thank you so much for listening. Just thanks so much for the support. And thanks for doing your homework, Hannah. <laughs> I oh. made her basically binge watch these shows with me. <laughs> well, we didn't watch them together, but yeah. we binge watched them both shows in like four days total. Yep. Um, so yeah, happy new year, everyone. Bye, talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning into Abundance. We appreciate your support. We hope to have PK to your interest. Feel free to contact us at AbundancePodcast5678 at gmail.com and give us feedback on what you'd like to hear. That is Abundance without parentheses. Go dance yourself silly. Bye for now. A special thank you to Richard D. Fiore for our lovely podcast tune and my wonderful boyfriend, Matt Mellish, for our cover art.